to bingo blast off here we are the closing show of the week where the road leads the road leads to four to five every friday where the road leads that's not a loop uh, anyway we we have a very interesting configuration today our principal guest is uh, dave child of orbicare joins us by skype from california la is it dave Yep, we're right out here in Los Angeles. We have many questions to ask you about the principal in industry in L.A., namely f filmmaking. Okay, and uh, we don't have a Skype video with, with um, Ted Ralston and Margie, but we have a picture of them, and they are such a lovely couple, and we have their voice, and they are joining us by Skype audio from the Big Island. Um, welcome, Ted and Margie. We're right here in the uh, Think Tech Hawaii West studio. <laughs> <laughs> east, east. <laughs> Actually, west. We're, we're west of you, Jay. You're east. We're, we're west. Okay. All right. And today we're going to talk about a new and surprising topic, drones. So let me, let me throw in some thoughts uh, just in order of chronology. The first thing that uh, and I told you about this, Ted, that blew my mind uh, was this kid in Connecticut who decided a couple of strange decisions. One is that he was gonna, uh, he was gonna put some handguns on a drone, a pretty, pretty substantial drone actually, uh, and see if he could fire, fire the handguns guns by radio. And that was the first decision. That was an interesting kind of thing to do. Um, and he did it, although you mentioned, Ted, that maybe, maybe it was a ruse. Um, and the second thing he did is he took a picture of it uh, a video of it firing these weapons, uh, and he posted that on YouTube, and that was probably more bizarre than the first thing because the FAA got wind of that. It went viral, and the FAA came down upon him, uh, and uh, you can't do that. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure where it goes, but I'm wondering what kind of comments you have about this kid in Connecticut. Uh, what does this tell you? know, one thing about drones, UAV, you know, it goes where the road leads. It goes anywhere. You don't know where it's going to go. We can't possibly imagine what kind of issues and strange events are going to take place in the next six months, much less a year. Uh, so what do you think about the kid in Connecticut? What does it teach us? Dave? Yep. What's your thought? Yep. Dave, you go yeah. first. Dave, go first. What does that teach us? Well... It teaches us that there's a whole new technology and there's a whole new way of uh, of devices that are coming out there. And, uh, you know, this was just a, a kid who decided that, hey, this is something interesting we can do. Let's see if we can, uh, you know, modify our, our toy in some way. But it does show you that there's a lot of capabilities for these, for these uh, quote, toys. Um, and there, there's a lot of advantages to them as well. This just happened to be something fun that a kid was putting together, and uh, now it got itself in a little bit of trouble for it. Yeah, I wonder what's going to happen with the FAA. I think they told him, no, you can't do that. Right. <laughs> they don't like that. They don't like that. Well, I mean, you know, it's a good, good, it's, it's good, an interesting good situation here <laughs> that the FAA has to deal with. We had a very active drone club meeting last night, had the local FAA, FISDO, and, uh, and HCF present, and we were talking about these very issues. Uh, the FAA basically deals with airspace access and, and safety, and uh, people shooting pistols in, a, in their backyard is, is sort of a different category of, of, uh, of safety issues, which is more of a local police enforcement issue, unless the guy is flying up in the national airspace somewhere. So one, one of the things that the drones do introduce, Jay, is this very complicated uh, jurisdictional area where you have overlapping jurisdictions, and we have no prior history of understanding how to sort out uh, uh, one versus the other in terms of the jurisdictional limitations. But that's where Dave comes into the picture, basically introducing commercial civil drone operations in Hawaii through the company Levanui, which is part of his enterprise. Well, let me and, let me uh, go back. Let me go back to the pistol for a minute before we go go there. Uh, we, we have plenty of plenty of road to go here. Um, you know, if I, if I have a drone up there and I, I bought it at, I bought it at a place where I can't necessarily be traced. And, um, you know, as opposed to the wing from the, uh, what that the plane they found at reunion off, um, Africa, uh, there, there's no serial number on it 
dashboard, I remove the serial number. It's, I can't be, I can't be traced to this. I mean, they're, they're, they're fungible. It's a commodity already. And I put a, I put a weapon on it and likewise that can't be traced. I can do, I can do drone assassinations. Um, and you can't trace the radio signal, I guess. Uh, how do we stop that? You know, everybody would be doing drone assassinations, a whole new industry. Uh, what, what can we do about that? I mean, is there a serious risk of this? That's, I think, what, why the FAA got excited. That's why I got excited, to, you know, to think that some kid could go and do that and either hurt somebody accidentally or intentionally, and it's hard to prove it. If he doesn't admit it, it's hard to prove it. Um, what do you think? I mean, this is, is this threatening to anybody here? Dave? I don't personally think it's necessarily threatening because the threat isn't because there's now all of a sudden a drone that's capable of something like that. If you have an individual that wants to go out and intentionally commit a crime, perhaps involving the use of a gun, you know, I think the individual is the problem, not necessarily the fact that we can attach it to a drone. Yeah. Now, obviously, the drone would be able to open up different avenues that might not uh, necessarily be easily accessible, but the individual is still the Sure, the sure, target. and he's the, he's the criminal, but right. if I'm a prosecutor, I got to make my case, and if I can't connect him to the drone or the pistol, I got a hard case, and you know, and the radio signals aren't traceable, really. Uh, I'd have to, I have to figure out how to make my case on this. This is a new That's kind of crime. That is a new one, right? That puts in, uh, puts a little, a big, a little gap in between uh, the weapon and the criminal. Huh? Yeah. So I mean, I think we're in a new place on that, and I think, you know, remember this discussion. But we could find in the next six months or a year that it's not a kid in Connecticut anymore that it's organized crime, that it's somebody who wants to do an assassination. They know where you are, they know what you look like, they have a camera, um, and it goes out there and does something dastardly. Uh, are, are you uh, at all concerned about this, Ted? Well, actually, uh, I think there's gonna have to be a, a lot of education, a lot of uh, criminalization of these kind of acts to provide proper incentive to not do them. No different than, a, than putting a putting a pistol on the end of a long pole and shooting somebody. True. Uh, but there, the other piece that will come into the, into the game is the traceability of this information. And uh, where the command and control circuit of a, of a drone could be traced and recorded, uh, the firing commands, all that sort of thing, that's all basically in the radio spectrum. And that can be recorded once you know what frequency it's on. Yeah. So we'll, we'll have to step up with that kind of uh, preventative and, and uh, discovery uh, measure in order to properly police these things. Because yeah. you are right, there are enough uh, uh, call them crackpots, frankly, for uh, around to take advantage of anything. And uh, we've, uh, society's managed to control that through various uh, incentives and disincentives. And the same will be true here. It's just that every, every new technology requires a new method of discovery and, and reporting in order to keep it uh, properly controlled. Yeah. Well, I think, what, I think one's, one thing is clear is that these possibilities are revealing themselves, you know? Uh, it's like carving a statue out of marble. As you carve, you find there are new and exciting possibilities in there somewhere. And, and the more you carve, the more you see the possibility. I think that's what's happening. I also think that it's moving faster, that more people, you know, are knowing the possibilities and more people are creative about it. Um, and uh, it, I think we're going to see some really interesting uh, uses of drones uh, come up soon. And that takes me to the second point uh, that came out, which I mentioned before the show, and that is uh, um, Amazon. I mean, it's not just that Amazon wants to drop something in front of your front door, but Amazon wants to organize the airspace so that it has a slice of the airspace, I mean, I suppose, and others, uh, and can have avoidance technology and actually deliver through this reserved airspace. All of a sudden, the crazy idea from, you know, six months ago um, in that 60 Minutes report, if you remember, all of a sudden it takes on a reality. If, if I have reserved airspace and I stay within the reser reserved airspace, I can get to your front door in very quick time 
uh, and, and actually do exactly what he wanted to do. Uh, what do you guys think about this? Is this, is this doable? Is this going to happen? Is this something the FAA would, you know, would let happen? And, and is it commercially feasible? I mean, is this real yet? I, I'd like to lead off on that one. Um, this is the sort of thing that, that you wouldn't turn to the FAA to, uh, to create or a cause to happen. You would turn to a congressional competitive effectiveness domain and have a congressional push to tell the FAA to reserve a chunk of airspace for this kind of function. Then the FAA would find a way to regulate it. But it doesn't start in the FAA. It starts really in the congressional committees and such that deal with U.S. competitiveness or some other aspect of the economy that generates what congressmen are dealing with, which is jobs and security and uh, prosperity. Both are the things that drive them. They will tell the FAA what to do when presented with the right case. Uh, the very reason we have 333 exemptions is exactly for that reason. Uh, the movie industry was successful in convincing the FAA that by the argument of equivalent safety, it was better to use drones than manned helicopters. Yeah. In some, in some cases. And that yeah. allowed the FAA to have that liability removed from them, and they could then go ahead and authorize it. So yeah. it'll take some very creative economic thinking to take the Amazon uh, concept forward. But, and the notion of reserved airspace is somewhat new. It hasn't been, hand, it hasn't occurred before, other than the reservations uh, reserved air, or, or uh, restricted airspace that the military gets. But we do have reserved communication channels and uh, communication um, uh, frequencies that are auctioned off, as a matter of fact. That's so a great, that's a great point, Dave. That, that is such an interesting parallel. We're not talking about airspace in the spatial sense. We're talking about airspace in, in the communication sense, and we have plenty of law about that. We have a history of, oh, 100-plus years of trying to reserve frequencies, AM and FM, for the public use. And, you know, you're right. I mean, Congress could, should provide the structure and then leave it to the FAA to, to manage that space. But there, there's precedent in, in communications. What an interesting parallel. Who would have thunk six months ago that this, this parallel would, would be presented? What do you think, Ted? Well, again, that's, that was uh, my comment in the first place, and I stand behind my comment, which you agreed with, Jay, which is the first time you've ever agreed with anything I said, so I feel good. I, I feel good, too, you know, being compelled to agree with you. This is a really interesting moment. You know, th things do change, you know. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, no, Dave, the, Dave's a guy who does this for real with the exemption he's got at several companies within his enterprise. And it would be really interesting to get from him, I think, the perspective of uh, the technology that it's going to take to allow this kind of airspace reservation to occur and for commerce to occur within that boundary without escaping it, without having any downside consequences. Oh, uh, huge, huge. What Dave is doing is huge. Uh, and we want to get to that in detail, exactly how he's using it, how he foresees using it, uh, how he got his 333 exemption right after this break. So we'll take a short break. That's Dave Child of Orbicare in California, who has a 333 exemption from the FAA. And in the Big Island, uh, uh, Ted, uh, Ted Ralston and Margie. And we're going to discuss uh, the movies. We're going we're gonna to take a a trip to California to discuss the movies in L.A. We'll be right back. You'll see. Stand by. Aloha. My name is Jim Sean, and I'm host of a show called Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. Each week, live streaming at noon on Think Tech Hawaii, we interview people who have special insights into education from early education through K-12, all the way through higher education and beyond. Both public and private are areas we're interested in. We dig deeper. We try to find out uh, what it's really like to be involved in making change, advocating for it, how you reform, what people's philosophies are in reforming it. Uh, as I said, we're live streaming every Wednesday at noon on Think Tech Hawaii. And later on, 
You can find these interviews on YouTube and on the Hawaii Educational Policy Center website. We hope you join us as many times as possible. Aloha. One. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here. This is getting very exciting now because uh, Dave Child uh, is using drones for movie making. He's ordinarily, he's, he's been using helicopters to get these aerial shots, but things are changing. So Dave, we're, we're very interested in um, what you're doing, how you're changing it, how drones are involved, and the challenges of incorporating them. Yeah. All right, Jay, yeah, well, uh, we're out here in Los Angeles, so obviously there's a big market for uh, filmmaking, aerial photography, uh, and the such. But yeah, we do operate, uh, and we historically have operated full-size helicopters, um, and which are obviously fantastic for getting the job, but oftentimes are very, uh, very expensive for that uh, purpose. So, you know, over the past few years, we've seen a lot of the drone companies come out and uh, there was no regulations on them because it was sort of a, you know, a, a new, a new territory. Uh, now, over the last uh, year or two, there have been some regulation uh, involved in it. And naturally, we, being an aerial production company, we needed to get on board with that. But we had, we had done jobs where uh, we worked side by side with different drone companies. And so naturally, uh, we needed to say, all right, well, let's provide everything aerial. And we'll do the drone stuff. You know, we're very uh, well versed in in aerial production, aerial coordination. So we decided that uh, we should go ahead and get on board with the with the drone filming. And it's a real compliment to the helicopters. You know, I never felt it as a as a threat to us, but it, it's just a new technology and it's a new way of doing it. So it's something to embrace. Uh, it's definitely part of something that uh, assists and, and sometimes it's the main event sometimes it's a side event well here you know here you are faced um, with um, the need to satisfy a client a movie maker client and on the one hand you have your conventional helicopters which you've used for a while um, to do certain kinds of jobs and then you have this possibility of of using drones for other kinds of jobs the costs are different um, and I suppose a lot of the operational issues are different. But could you tell us when you would pick the one to do the job and when you would pick the other? Well, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question, yes. When would you pick one versus the other? You know, we did a job the other day where it involved a full-size helicopter, and it was just going to be the helicopter. And then we started talking to production and says, hey, well, we have this drone that can now film... The helicopter as we're filming from the helicopter. Oh, right? really? So, That's great. <laughs> oh, this, oh, this is interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, they kind of like that. You know, so it added a whole new dimension to their production with that, without adding a huge extra amount of budget to it. Yeah. So sometimes, like in the helicopter world, um, if we're going to multiple locations, it's actually more efficient and more economic to go with a full size helicopter because we can get from one spot to another uh, fairly rapidly. If we're going to be on location in one spot the whole time, a drone could do the job. Mm -hmm. if, we were, if we were traveling to multiple locations, now we're talking about, you know, uh, set up, shoot, disassemble, pack, relocate, unpack, set up, you know, so that, that could take a, a, long, a long day. How about altitude? Is that a factor? With the drones, uh, you're typically shooting on a fixed length uh, lens, so you don't go too high. In other words, you, you know, you, you zoom with the drone. In other words, you fly closer or you fly farther away. You don't manipulate the lenses too much. Um, so in that extent, if you need zoom capabilities and you need higher altitudes and stuff like that, that's where a real helicopter, which can carry a heavier payload, comes in handy yeah and then the, you know the other option of course is do you need the director on board that you know does he need to be there you know if he needs to be there well then maybe that's a helicopter job you know so there's the the different variations with that, the that might change though going forward i mean if i say to you well 
uh, I'm going to give you a drone for, say, twice as much money, but still a lot cheaper than a helicopter, which will take commands, to, uh, take instructions from the director on the ground and do all the kinds of things. And if I give you a camera that will zoom, you know, a small, yep. tiny camera that will zoom and be, you know, very miniature of a big camera, yep. then that might, that might change the way uh, this Absolutely. works. But that you know, technology is coming, yeah. It's... Uh, Hawaii Five O, if you've seen it, and maybe you're involved in it. Uh, Hawaii Five O, loaded with helicopter shots. Yes. And uh, there it's beautiful, and you you know you'd have to have a major good camera to take right. the kind of shots you see in Hawaii Five O. It's it's great resolution, great shots. Right. So I imagine that there's no camera right now that you could fit on a drone that would give you the quality of those aerial shots, and we don't have it yet. Am I right? Well, not necessarily. There are some of those cameras that can can fit on the drone, um, and those drones get very expensive. You know, they can be up fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars for those drones. The camera package that you're talking about could be up in thirty, forty thousand dollars. So you could be looking around, you know, a hundred thousand dollars flying around to get some of those shots. Um, but as a, you know, I, I didn't work on that on that TV show, however. But if um, you know, to get the scenic shots as they're flying around the, the islands and stuff like that, that wouldn't be possible with the drone. That That is two helicopters flying all around the area. You know, the drone's really going to come in in uh, in handy when it's on that closed set, when it's sort of a fixed location and you're not going too far. What yeah. about the risk of uh, damage falling out of the sky, what have you? Uh, if I have $100,000 worth of gear, invested mm -hmm. you know in this drone uh, yeah uh, I mean is that is that a good bet uh, or am I taking too much risk for the investment in the equipment it's a it's a big risk however and that's what separates uh, you know the the major players from the sort of the hobbyist enthusiasts mm -hmm. you know and that that's where we come in and say okay well we are a full aerial service provider we we, we are uh, licensed you know, we're FA approved, we're insured, and that's the big difference, you know. You can get somebody to work on your house, uh, and they can do it for cheap, but you don't always get a permit for it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the difference is, you know, we take all the steps to make sure that everything is legal. We do have that exemption in place. We do, all of our pilots are actual helicopter pilots, and we're insured, is which was one of the bigger differences there. Because, yeah, if you have a hundred thousand dollars go into the ocean on accident that's not so good not so good <laughs> so ted what do you what do you think i mean is this is the model that dave is talking about is that a long-term sustainable model in the industry or do you think dave is going to be faced with equipment that is cheaper uh and that will you know test the the economics of the of owning a helicopter or renting a helicopter do you think for example in five or ten years uh, that Dave will still have helicopters, or will Dave wind up, you know, uh, with high-tech equipment that does the same job? Well, the, the technology always advances, Jay and, and Dave, as you know, and we're sitting here holding a cell phone in my hand that has a lot more capability than it ever had before. And by the way, just to, for the record, uh, Margie corrected me, uh, uh, Hilo is actually east of Honolulu. I had, uh, had that wrong, but she, she made sure I got that right. So I... <laughs> And correctly, and uh, never been to Hilo before in my life. That must be where I didn't know where it was. But uh, in any case, uh, uh, the the technology will continue to advance. The central packages are going to continue to get better. The method of of which images are actually recorded, it will change as time goes on. As different methods of picking up the reflective uh, signal from a, a a a scene are are continually improved. So. We're always going to see that, which will result in miniaturization, higher resolution, and uh, more varied and youthful uh, capability. The other thing that we really have to work on, and I think Dave and I were talking about this earlier today on the phone, is the very issue that you bring up. That is the reliability, and the corollary to that is safety. It has to start occurring in systems that we call drones and put them out there. The concept of losing one cannot be any higher than the concept of losing a commercial airliner. If we're in a situation where there could be economic or personal loss involved here. So we, we, we have a big design challenge ahead of us 
in order to get the level of reliability up so that the mission is completed and that $100,000 payload comes back ready to be reset and recycled rather than splashed all over the mountainside. And uh, we succeeded in doing that in aircraft over the last 100 years with the CAA and then later the FAA helping through certain design standards that progressively mitigate and minimize the occurrence, the chance of occurrence of an event and minimize the consequences of that event. Now we've got to transport that design knowledge over and the methods and the certification procedures and all that over into the world of the drones and get that reliability up so that when you launch the mission, it will complete. So there's, there's a lot of development yet ahead and uh, nobody should think that what we see as drones today will be what we're going to see in five years. As oh, drones. There's money to be made. You know, when I went looking at that that uh, the, that video that the kid made um, of the of the drone with the gun, just accidentally in in YouTube there were a bunch of other videos showing some of these. Um, I don't know if you say homemade, but some of these newer drones, and they were pretty big. These are available to civilians, right? Pretty big, and they big props on them, like you know five maybe more um, you know motors and. Uh, a, a wing sp or a drone span of maybe I don't know three four feet. They were not little tiny ones. I know you can get them all sides sizes, but it struck me that if something like that with those propellers fell out of the air or wound up giving somebody a haircut, um, that would be a serious injury or worse. And I'm wondering if the technology is there or being developed, uh, you know, for avoidance. And uh, I hate to mention this, given the amount of money involved, but uh, self-destruction. In other words, in case that drone is, is, you know, coming down, and in case it's in a populated area, would you rather have, would you rather have something that will try to land it on a dime, um, or would you rather have something that will blow it up in little pieces so it doesn't do any damage? Uh, thoughts? Dave? Yeah, well, I think uh, what Ted was leading on to there with the reliability mm -hmm. is uh, spot on there because that's where that's where it needs to go, and that's where uh, the I think one of the larger problems is the confidence that the public has in these things. They feel that there's going to be a safety hazard to them, so there has to be uh, you know some sort of uh, safety mechanism, as you're mentioning there, Jay. And they do have some of them on some of these larger ones. You you can you can get a a parachute system. Parachute, sure. Goes in them. Yeah. You know, which will do just that. And some of them, you know, they are developed with, you know, some of these ones that have eight, um, eight, twelve uh, different motors and rotors on them. You know, they can sustain flight if you lose, you know, twenty percent of them. Yeah. Which is pretty, pretty impressive. But. Um, well, you know, you know, what I'd like to do. I'd like to take a short break, and come back and get to the real heart of the deal. And that is your um, your 333 exemption, because right. uh, that's the real that's the real um, uh, pushing the envelope here. And uh, so let me take a short break. We'll, we'll do that now. This is uh, Dave Child in Orbicare in L.A. Uh, and uh, Ted Ralston and Margie uh, Ralston in uh, Big Island, uh, which is just north of here. I'm only kidding. Uh, <laughs> and we'll come right back and then we'll talk about the exemption. This is very important for the public to know about. Okay, we'll take a break now. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen. I host Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. And I do this because I care about science literacy in Hawaii. I want to spread the understanding that science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life. I want to make sure the broadest possible spectrum of people understand the beauty and the value of science and realize that science plays out each and every day of their lives. I want you to understand that science is fun. So we bring on to this show each week guests who are scientists, from astronomers to zoologists, and we talk about what they do and how they do it. But most importantly, we talk about why you should care about their work, why you should see that their work has value and impact on your life. So I hope you'll join us Fridays, 1 p.m., here on Think Tech Hawaii. You can watch us via live stream. You can watch us uh, recorded on Olelo. And you can see us uh, each week. We hope you'll join us.
Okay, we're back. We're live for the last third of our program with Dave Child of Orbicare, which is, a, I guess, a helicopter, movie helicopter operation in L.A. And uh, Ted Ralston and Margie in the Big Island, uh, they're attending a, a drone event uh, there. Um, uh, and here we are on Where the Road Leads, and we're talking now about the 333 exemption. So <clears throat> that's the big news. Uh, you know, Dave, you're, you're remarkable in the sense that you're actually using drones to make a buck. Uh, I can't think of anybody else who actually, you know, the rest of it is pie in the sky, maybe one day Amazon, but you know, you're doing it today. So tell us what you had to do to get legal, how you got the 333 exemption, um, you know, advise the public on what they would have to do if they wanted to go down the same path. Well, it's a, it, it's a, it's a big process of government paperwork. <laughs> okay, fair. Uh, but, uh, you know, our, our primary uh, chief of operations there, Tim Lerma, uh, who operates Le Wanui, uh out there in the, in the uh, islands out there, mm -hmm. he headed up, spearheaded mo the majority of the paperwork on this one. And what it involves is, is really following a whole bunch of instructions from the FAA, telling them what you will do, what you will not do, and how you will comply within their regulations of that. Um, right now, the regulations are fairly gray, so there's not a whole lot of guidance on it. So you're kind of uh, bobbing and weaving your way through some of these regulations. And at the same time, we're helping to develop what the future regulations might become and what the, uh, what the restrictions might be. You know, as, as part of the exemption, uh, we need to provide a monthly reporting to them of what jobs did we do, uh, were there any issues on them? You know, that way they can help. It'll help further develop the regulations that do finally become, which I think they should have out. Um, I'm thinking they're aiming for uh, in 2016. So uh, they put out some notice of proposed rulemakings, and uh, and we're sort of working within those guidelines as well. Mm -hmm. But the exemption process itself uh, primarily is writing a exemption request and how you will uh, operate within there so as to not create a hazard to persons or properties uh, within the areas that you're going to operate on. Um, once you submit the request for that, it's, uh, it's probably in a three to six month uh, holding period where they review the documents and then come back to you with either yes we agree or no we don't agree, please revisit these areas. So it's um, iterative. So you, you might go back and forth a number of times. It sounds absolutely. like the patent office, you know, where you talk to them and they make you change things and ultimately you get approved. Exactly, right. And then so the 333 exemption in and, itself, in and of itself is not enough to conduct operations. From there, you need a certificate of authority, which they call a, a COA, a COA. Mm -hmm which gives you jurisdictional operations within certain guidelines. So there's a blanket authorization that says, hey, you can operate as long as we've approved your 333 exemption. You can now operate uh, as long as you maintain under 200 feet. You stay five miles away from an airport. You must be able to see your, your drone at all times. You can't do it at nighttime. So th there's a handful of restrictions. And then anytime you do operate that, you need to file a, a NOTAM, which is a notice to airmen, to advise any other aircraft flying that these types of operations are going to be existing at this specific location. But where do you, where do you file that with? That gets filed with a, uh, the, the flight service station, which is where the pilot, that's a, an area where the pilots go to get different weather uh, briefings, advisories, and such. Uh, for that, so it's it's an arm of the FAA, mm -hmm. and then that gets as part as a regular pilot, as a you know flying an aircraft, uh, we check those before we go to a certain location. So if somebody, like let's say somebody was going to be doing parachute activities in a location, they file this and say that they're going to be doing parachute activities from 12 to 2 at this location, so that if somebody's flying in the area, they're aware of that. That potential hazard. 
Yeah, so, so it's, it's like it sounds like a flight plan of sorts, right? You're going to be there. Yeah, exactly. So we're putting the notice out there to say, hey, we will be operating, you know, uh, over at this golf course, let's say. And that way, if a pilot is flying in that area, they'll at least know to be looking out for it. Um, so that's a certificate of authority. Mm -hmm. And then if you need to do operations outside of that exemption, then you need to request permission for something else. So that one is uh, 200 feet. Let's say we needed to do something uh, at 400 feet. Now you need to apply and get permission for that as well. So there's many, many layers of uh, permission that might be required. Yeah, so if, if you change your need, you know, I mean, uh, who knows, in the movie business, you're, you're looking for creative uh, outcomes and so forth, and you may find that what you filed before for the exemption, it doesn't really cover the movie you're about to make. Um, and here you are, you, you're organizing this movie for the near term. Uh, are you able to go back to them and say, I need a change, I need a, you know, something else to let me do my job here? Will they yes, respond absolutely. to that? So you can file amendments. And each of the, uh, we'll back up for a second there on the 333 exemption itself, you actually have to state which type of drone you're going to be operating. So like you're saying, if we're going to do a job in the future and now we needed a bigger drone to carry a bigger camera or a bigger payload, we may not be approved for that. Now we've got to go back to the FAA and request this particular aircraft to be approved. And that could, depending on what it is, it could take a week, two weeks, could take two months. So, so but uh, they're sensitive, though. I, I, from what you say, it sounds like they're sensitive to the notion that you, you may, for business purposes, you need to have this pretty quickly. You can't wait two or three years to find out about a bigger payload. You have to have it now if you're going to make a living doing this. Right. Yeah, yeah and, and they have, uh, they they do seem to be fairly, fairly quick on their turnaround on it. I, I will say that uh, it, the initial exemption probably took about six months, so the initial one does take a little bit of time, um, and then of course any back and forth can only add to it. Yeah, it's like uh, developing credibility uh, with them, so they they know who you are, and they have a certain level of confidence in you. So, uh, no. so Ted, I, let, me, let me go to Ted for a minute. Ted, you know, you've been talking for some time about, um, you know, the, the possibility that what Dave is doing, other people would want to do too. As a matter of fact, anybody who makes movies would be interested in this because of the huge amount of money they would save if they didn't have to uh, hire or buy a helicopter on a given occasion. Uh, it would be so easy, for example, to uh, stand in a field uh, let a drone go up there and, and take aerial pictures and, and then have them ready quickly, you know, for, for the movie. So uh, we, you and I have talked about it, and um, gee whiz, uh, this, this could be, what Dave is doing could become very popular among a great number of people, not only in Hollywood, but anywhere movies are made, because people, honestly, people love aerial shots. It, it really enhances the marketability of the product. So, so Ted, uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, Jay actually goes uh, well beyond the collection of uh, video imagery. Uh, we know that um, things like uh, invasive species are a big issue here in Hawaii. Uh, beach erosion, uh, sand accretion and sand deletion, um, even the smoke over in Maui when the cane fields are burned and the chemical characterization of the smoke is an issue. Uh, cell phone tower communication capability when the cell phone towers are down, determining what that uh, electronic spectrum hole looks like and how to fill it with a temporary drone supported communication device, for example. Many, many, many functions can be performed and provided by these drones uh, quickly and at a cost a lot lower uh, than other means. However, there is a point in scale where it, a manned aircraft makes more sense. So there's a cost break somewhere so it's, it's really where the economics, the value to society, and, uh, uh, and the risk all sort of merge that determines which one of these systems would be better. But all I, kinds I of considerations. I know we don't allow monologues in this program, but I'm not at the studio, 
so I can break that rule. And by the way, Margie confirmed uh, there is another geographical error. Uh, Hilo is actually south of Honolulu, rather than the report we had earlier that Hilo was north of Honolulu. We'll, yeah. We'll worry on our geography here. But um, the, if you put yourself in the FAA's shoes for a minute, uh, you know, we talk about the FAA, the FAA, the FAA, all these layers and these obligations, these limitations. They're really bending over backwards to make this whole domain happen for us. And uh, their, their situation is they have to obey the law. The law is given to them by Congress. They're finding many, what you might even call loopholes around these laws as the rules are changing. And the FAA has even said, show us your, give us your best, your most outlandish idea where these things, these drones can help. And we'll together figure out how to do an experiment, do some testing, do some development. But uh, that's the, great. You I, know, I mean, we, we are beginning about them being stuck in the mud. It sounds like they've handled it pretty well. Uh, and that they're, you know, they become the right agency to shepherd this effort forward. And I want to, I want to ask Dave about that. Um, Dave, do you feel that the FAA has been flexible enough? Do you feel that they offer, uh, you know, the creative latitude that you need in order to make a living at this? Uh, you, you're a pioneer. You're a leader, and uh, you know we can learn so much from you. You know, I, I think they have come around uh, quite a bit. And that being said, I, I think they had no choice because these things, the technology is moving so rapidly and they were getting out there. They, I think they were forced to, uh, their hands were tied. They needed to come up with something to somehow regulate these types of operations. Are you going to stay with it? I mean, you're a pioneer. You've, you've put some real money, real time into getting to push the envelope here and use it in business. Um, are you committed to continuing that effort being out ahead and, and uh, developing this ahead of the crowd? Uh, are you wedded to it? Absolutely. That's what I figure, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> so we, we could resist it the whole time, you know? It's like cruise control on your car. It's there, you can use it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Well, well uh, Ted, I, I wanna offer you the opportunity to uh, Thank Dave for appearing and sharing with us um, and, um, and closing the show because you're the true host, even though we, we can only see a picture of you and Marky. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, once again, we come to the end of our last segment in uh, Where the Road Leads. This episode dealing with the emergence, the real emergence of civil, commercial UAV operations as represented by uh, Levanui and uh, Dave Child, who is the mastermind behind that, along with uh, your partner here in, on Big Island, who's out flying right now. But if, if there were one thing you wanted to have the public hear, Dave, from your experience and your ideas of going forward, what might that thought be? You know, I, I, would, uh, I would just ask the public to really embrace this technology as something that can help in society. There's so many possibilities with it, and it's just opening up the ideas and allow them to come. And then we do it with, within, the, within the constraints of safety and, uh, and confidence. What a great time to be alive. What a great time to engage yep. with technology. What a great thing to follow. Where the road leads. That's Dave Child of Orbicare in LA, uh, received a 333 exemption, and, uh, and uh, Ted Ralston in uh, the Big Island uh, at, at some uh, uh, direction from Honolulu. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen. It's been a great discussion with you. Have a great weekend. See you soon. See you next week, Ted. Okay. Bye-bye, Jay. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks you, a lot. Dave. All right. Thank you, guys.